You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I feel like who art ed? Try to spice it. Who art is Mr. Wood <laughs> art ed me? Yeah. Either way, it, it, it's ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. That's off to a great start. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in an audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and joining me today, I have Matthew Bliss, a fellow podcaster and fellow teacher, host of the Teaching Culture Cast and The Dead Drop, a video game news podcast, coming to me all the way from Australia. Thank you for joining me. No worries. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm glad we could get the time change to work, and I'm glad you could fit me into your schedule. We've been meaning to do this episode since you were kind enough to host me on your podcast, the Teaching Culture Cast. What was that probably like a month ago? Yeah, yeah. And look, I'm not even going to try and argue about time zones because we're currently <laughs> in the shift of daylight savings for one of us and then maybe not the other. And from what I understand, your uh, your parliament is trying to shift to keep daylight savings too. So I don't even try. I just look at the, I Google it and then see what happens. <laughs> yeah, time makes no sense. I mean, it's Tuesday here, it's Wednesday there. I don't even know how you keep things straight being, from what I understand, upside down all the time. Look, it's, it's weird, but you acclimatize over time. <laughs> um, but if anyone from the US listening wants to experience something a bit unusual, definitely come to Australia. It's a great time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, Sydney is on on my list of places to go. I know you're coming from Victoria, um, but mm -hmm. everything I've seen, I mean, Australia, beautiful country. Wish I could be there, but I appreciate that you're joining me from there. And we're going to be talking about an Australian artist today. And once again, just the consummate professional, you taught me about an artist I was not familiar with. Today's subject is Arthur Boyd. Now, Arthur Boyd came from an artistic family. Um, his, his father was a potter. His mother was a painter. I think there were like half a dozen prominent artists in the Boyd family. He grew up in, you're going to have to help me with this, Morumbina. Sure. Uh, we'd say in Australia, well, you know, the Australian Australian accent does things to words. Doesn't mean it's right, but we would say Marumbina. Marumbina, um, yep. which, is, which is like in Melbourne, right? Yeah. And his home life sounds like it was really nice. Uh, his parents were creative types, and it sounds like they just gave him a lot of freedom and space to explore. Um an experiment. I, I think his home was referred to as like open country or something like that. Is that like an Australian thing? Because as I was doing the research here, I kept seeing name like names for homes. Is that a thing people do there? A little bit. Um, obviously, you can imagine the uh, deserted rural landscape of, or well, literally anywhere that isn't metropolitan cities in Australia. Uh, and trying to number them, you can imagine, would be a little bit uh, almost irrelevant. Like there's house number one on this street, and then you travel, you know, 10 kilometers or, you know, eight miles, and there's number two. So it doesn't really make too much sense. But um, naming of houses is a thing that's just, you know, some people do it, some people don't. Uh, from memory, there was a house I used to visit in my youth on holidays that a family friend owned. Um, it was just on the Mornington Peninsula somewhere, but they called it Saratoga. Oh, that sounds so, lovely. See yeah, here, nice. see here in the States, it's like only like the wealthiest of wealthy, the elitist people have like a name for their home, you know, like the Kennedy compound and stuff like that. Or here it's like, mm. I'm just, you know, living on my block. And if anyone refers to my house, it's most likely probably just referred to as that house um you know well, but it's, it's the interesting difference in our cultures i'd say because australia going all the way back history time guys um you know it's a, it's a convict country where uh people who weren't wanted in some countries were you know shipped off to australia or some went for a brand new life and uh we are multicultural but we've also created our own our own culture through that so taking ownership of where you live is kind of a big thing too. So I can understand the difference there where the wealth, wealthy 
in America would be trying to etch out their own space. In Australia, you're kind of, you know, implored to take ownership of where you are and, you know, become part of the country. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, getting into that historical context and taking ownership of the country. One of the things that struck me when I was doing this research and I was looking into, and I cannot pronounce the name of um, Bundanan, which we'll get to later, right? You know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. You know, Bundanan, I, I would say. It Bundanan. Sounds- um, and that was that was Boyd's home that he later donated and it became this trust and then everything like that. Um, when I have done reading on there, I recall seeing like land acknowledgments and things like that, which I would presume probably in Australia, just as an, in America, there's a lot of discussion of the native inhabitants who are here before the Europeans got got there and respect for the the indigenous people's land and traditions and and their culture and preserving that to the extent that we can right yes and it's definitely I, a big thing and i got the sense that boyd was among those people who felt that it was necessary to honor that because as i said when i've done this research and i've i've read about his home that became sort of this conservation space cuz it's like 2700 acres um, there are sort of land acknowledgments and everything like that, nodding to the history and the people who came before the European settlers. Yes, this is, this is a big thing all across Australia, no matter where you are. In most cases, when you're uh, you know, making a presentation or representing yourself on Australian country, there's going to be an area of indigenous country that preceded as you say, the time the Europeans jumped on it and said, it's mine. Um, So the acknowledgement of country in Australia is really important. It pays respect to the indigenous elders and uh, potentially the indigenous persons present who, you know, would say that they originate from the land. Um, And in full respect to that here, I'll make an acknowledgement of country. I'll say that I am coming to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people and pay my respect to any elders past, present, and emerging. And that's something that we commonly do in Australia. And in that same spirit, I should acknowledge and honor that I am coming from the lands of the Potawatomi. I love that you do that, and and that is a part of the cultural heritage. And like I said, that's one of the things that I was reading about that I thought was really nice, that Arthur Boyd was Mm -hmm. mindful of those issues, among other things. Um, So getting back to a little bit of his life story to give a little bit more context to the work, he, I guess, grew up in an environment I – today I read articles about how to raise my kids and uh, the philosophy that I see, it sounds like he was probably growing up in what's today referred to as free-range parenting. He was left to his own devices to experiment and try different things and he was largely self-taught in painting, just experimenting with the materials. And then he left school at age 13 to work Mm -hmm. in his his aunt's paint factory or I guess – I, I read it in an article that said his aunt's husband's paint factory, which, I mean, I think is also his aunt's and maybe his uncle's paint factory. Um, it was yeah, an it's, odd it's like phrasing. A, it's that awkward, awkward, uh, you know, it's not biological uncle. So yeah. do you say uncle or is it just the person married to your aunt? That, that's all I'd read that as, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe I'm just overthinking it. I was thinking, like, maybe they were trying to make it a little bit less clear with the family relations because people hear about a kid at age 13 working in a factory and they think, like, ooh, who's pulling the string so he could have that cushy gig, you know? <laughs> but he was largely self-taught, although he did attend some formal classes at the National Gallery School in like 1935, 1936. Then, as most men his age did, he served in World War II. He joined the army in 1941. And shortly after that, he met his wife, Yvonne Lenny. Um, They were taking art classes together, and they met in 1942, married 1945, so still during that World War II era. 
And it seems like the two of them were both concerned with social issues. I get the sense that she was maybe a little bit more engaged with that, at least really engaged politically with that. She was a she was a pacifist and for some time she was part of the Communist Party. Boyd shared like her same inclinations, but he wasn't really active in politics. I think he used the arts as his way of expressing his ideas. Um, and so he focused his painting a lot of times on ethical concerns, um, looking at outsiders and like group power dynamics, you know, getting a little bit probably in terms of what we talked about with the, the power differential between the European settlers and the um, indigenous, the aboriginal people in Australia. He also focused a little bit on the futility of war because – He saw the horrors of war firsthand, and Mm. he talked a little bit about, like, his work, I guess, really talked about, he visually depicted sort of paradoxical, like, beauty and fragility of nature, along with, at the same time, just, like, the devastating power of nature. Um, One of the common recurring strategies that I saw in his work is there's often sort of a figure, and it's not... It almost isn't always like human, but there's something that seems to be just like bearing witness to the scene in the composition. You know, he's showing these actions playing out. And as a viewer myself, I can I can look at that and and imagine what's going on in the scene, because a lot of times it's a very active composition. He's showing figures in action. But I think it's really cool that he also shows people witnessing that action or animals witnessing that action because it gets you to understand like there's that ripple effect. It's not just the people that are directly involved in something that feel its effects. Mm. And the the impact of his art is mostly in that depth. Like there are so many things that you can pick out of his work that – is an influence and leads to whatever ethical message he's trying to make as well. Um, the, the piece that we'll talk about in a sec, for example, is, you know, it's set in the Australian bush, which is common for him. And funnily enough, I learned a new word today. today. Apparently, Antipodean means that means Australian or New Zealandish or whatever that was from New Zealand. Like, I had no idea it was related to the antipode as opposed to antipodes from greek you know theater or wherever he was doing his stuff yeah in- interesting because i was like as you said that i'm trying like the nerd in me is trying to break it down into the parts of the term and you know because yeah. that's yeah. one that was familiar unfamiliar to me too um i'm yeah. gonna have to start working that into into conversations now so that i can get that smug yeah. sense of superiority that comes with like dropping a well, here, word that other people are like, what are you talking about? Here it is. You interviewed an Antipodean <laughs> podcaster. <laughs> Love it. Love it. You you can't um, turn off that teaching mode, you know? Nope. That, that's what happens when you get two teachers in a room, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, the depth of his art is uh, about being set in Australia, which can send a very specific message because Australian... Uh, rural Australia and the Australian environment is very unique. And um, <clears throat> the inspiration that he gets from uh, kind of Old Testament Bible, as well as the onset of war and dealing with that conflict, like with anything to do with his art, there's always a couple of different lenses you can pass over it to try and interpret what's happening in the picture. And ultimately, you come away with a message that's unique to you almost. That's partly why he was such a prolific artist in his time. Yeah. And, and, you know, just to wrap up a little bit of the background, you've already mentioned that a lot of his inspiration came from biblical stories, but also other classic stories that have been passed down through the ages. He was inspired by mythology. He did multiple depictions of Icarus, uh, the figure sort of, you know, the traditional story of Icarus flying too close to the sun and melting his wings. And Icarus would be depicted 
as sort of a warning in there. I mean, he's doing a lot with symbolism and using those figures to send a message, as you said. He he all it was never just like, well, here's an illustration of that story. It was always a little bit more to it. And so I think that provides us probably a good segue to talk about this piece that you picked out. Um, Nebuchadnezzar on fire, falling over a waterfall. Now, yes, the like eight year old boy in me is just from the title alone loving this. But uh, I'll let you go first. What are you seeing here? What's jumping out at you? Um, yeah, obviously, being an audio me- medium, this would be a little bit interesting. So, what we're looking at in this image is uh, kind of uh, light brush strokes, almost watercolors of a waterfall in what appears to be the Australian outback uh, with a number of onlookers that are kind of not very distinct. They're sort of amorphous in a way, but above all of that, we're seeing a a fiery figure plunging towards the waterfall. And that, you know, conceptualizes the piece in a way to try and capture the moment. And Nebuchadnezzar here, is a reference to the Babylonian king in the uh, uh, another tale of mythology there about someone who was uh, cast out of his kingdom. And then uh, he, I'm going to have to look for the quote here because it's, it's a little bit, <laughs> it's a little bit out there. So from the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And at the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven and mine understanding returned unto me and I blessed the Most High and he was reestablished in his kingdom. And that's very much the figure that we see pictured here, someone very animalistic. There's not much of the human figure left here, but you can see his hands are very much like claws and you can imagine the covering of his body could be like fur or something similar. Yeah. And it's interesting because he's described in these animalistic terms in, in the, the classic Bible story. And we see him here. You at first described like these silhouettes of figures on looking from a distance. It looks almost like silhouettes of figures in front of like a sunrise or sunset. Like the sky is yellow into pink into blue and it looks sort of like backlit figures. But then as you get closer, you see it's sort of birds perched atop. Um, I don't know, some like stick like branchy yeah. some sort of floor you know what i'm saying like it's it's plants yeah. or you know something sticking up from the ground that has birds perched atop and i think it's interesting because from a distance that forms a silhouette almost like the bird as a head and then it it feels like a skinny elongated um almost Giacometti style figure that looks kind of emaciated. But then as I look closer, it's like, oh, there's a bird on there that's looking at Nebuchadnezzar, who was who was compared to a bird in that story. And Nebuchadnezzar is in the air, flying, falling over that waterfall, and he's on fire. And mm. I find it really interesting in, in a number of ways because Also, looking at the image, the ground has more sort of visual weight. It's a bolder color in the ground, and it it occupies most of the canvas. And so then that gives it this gravity that feels like that's pulling my attention, and it also feels like Nebuchadnezzar is being pulled to the ground. You know, he's... He, he seems to be in, in midair, but falling. And it creates this tragic sense to it. And then I start to think about also like my historical connections because Arthur Boyd was, you know, born in, he was born in 1920. So he was born in the early 20th century. I was going to say late 19th century, but early 20th century. Um, yes. And he was still painting through 
till later in his life. He passed away in 1999, Mm -hmm. but this was made in the 1960s. And I think of that time in America, there was the civil rights movement, but also around the world, there were a lot of things happening. And this in some ways reminds me of footage I've seen of like Tibetan monks self-immolating. You know what I'm saying? Yes. I believe there's a lot of inspiration from the Vietnam War in this painting as well. I've I've got a feeling some of uh, what he has seen or experienced there has inspired this a little bit too, because that self-immolation is what I thought of as well. And we know that there's a lot of um, of, uh, photos out of Vietnam during that time where people were self-immolating. And so that, that could be right on the money, I think, that interpretation. And I guess for listeners not familiar with the term, we're using the term self-immolating because it sounds so much less depressing than the reality of what that means. That was people who set themselves on fire as a very, very strong protest. And Mm. it, for very obvious reasons, was a jarring image to anybody who's seen it. And it, it very much helped with turning public sentiment against the war. I mean, that's that's an act that is hard to ignore. And mm. you have to imagine that somebody who goes to those extremes probably has some strong convictions behind it. And I think that's probably why Boyd was choosing this imagery. He, he witnessed war firsthand in his youth when he was deployed in World War II. He just fundamentally phys- philosophically was not not a fan of violence and war and I am right there with him and yeah, absolutely and he was using his art as a way of raising awareness because it's what he could do throughout his life to do some good indeed definitely showed through a lot of his art um, his opposition to the war but it's really interesting that you mentioned, uh, his work with Icarus from earlier too. Mm-hmm. Um, I should have mentioned earlier, I've got a bit of a philosophy degree, so you're going to need to tell me when to stop analyzing this thing. <laughs> um, but the, the, the whole parallel with Icarus is kind of present here too, because immediately if you, if you don't have that background of understanding of war and what the nature of the Vietnam War, war was, you may think straight away, well, someone on fire in the air and what appears to be burning wings, it could be Icarus coming to his fall, which it, kind of relates to the Babylonian king, I guess, just slightly. It, it, I think it, it always boils down to hubris, mm. right? It always boils yep. down to somebody overstepping in some ways and paying a price for it. Yes. And and I think that's kind of what all of war is too. If you think yeah. about it, like it's it's somebody it's all it's pretty much always the result of somebody's greed and somebody's bad intentions and somebody seeing what they can get away with. A couple of people making decisions for large groups of people. Yeah. yeah. And I think I think what we have here is a nice sort of visual metaphor of that idea. And what I like is he's calling back to things that are really ancient sort of stories because that's what makes it sort of timeless. If he made this picture, you know, if he made this picture today, it would like, I could see this as something about Ukraine just as you know knowing the historical context okay this was probably about vietnam if he had made it years earlier i would say it was about world war 2 and it because he's he's getting to that level of sort of abstraction and getting into the symbol for the story instead of the specifics of the current time it makes it more relatable to a broader audience. And I think that's something, you know, my uh, 
artistically inclined listeners should be mindful of, is there's a reason we abstract things and make it less specific and more general. It's because, sadly, this is a lesson that we need to keep learning because if we don't learn from history, we're doomed to repeat its mistakes. That's it. And the prolific artist is the one that can be recognized across generations as well. And it's partly why Arthur Boyd was an artist that I picked because he is one of those prolific artists that we'll hear hear about for a very long time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, on that topic of how he has been appreciated for generations, I think the the final legacy that I, I want to point out about him is in 1993, he gifted Bundanan, I don't know, uh, his, his home and studio in Australia. He gave yeah. it to the country uh, of Australia. They The government accepted it. And it's now an arts organization and trust. It has a collection of generations of Boyd artists because, as I said, he was not the only one. He came from a talented family. And it's a museum. It offers classes to artists of all ages. And there's also, it's also, I think, like the largest artist-in-residency program in Australia. I should... I'll probably have to fact check that and I'll edit it out if I'm wrong. And it's a massive environmental preserve. It's 2,700 acres dedicated to the arts and preserving the land and the natural habitat. Because what I love about him is throughout his life, it seems like he was trying to do good. He was focused on the good. He was trying to send a message about what what people should be doing and what people should be thinking about, but he was also doing that himself. Yeah, and and like his representation was even uh, clear before he died because part another part of the reason that I picked him was because when I was in primary school or elementary school for the U.S. audience, <laughs> um, uh, we had houses. Well, you had houses the, in Australia. Yeah, we we had houses. Not, not houses. I just, I, I just pictured all of Australia as like just living in the bush and you ride a kangaroo to work. No? Look, at, at primary school, you have to go from <laughs> the, uh, as we would call uh, a swag, which is your bush sleeping bag, and then we get the house. No. <laughs> we were in, um, uh, look up Waltzing Matilda, everybody, and you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, in, in school, we had houses that we were split into for house events and house points and things like that. And one of those houses was Boyd. Uh, I think another was Drysdale and another Nolan. They were all picked according to famous Australian artists. But I was, of course, in Boyd. So it made sense to select it here. But And it's impacted you for years to come. Precisely. Stuck with you. That's it. His legacy remains. And an- another great thing that I feel like I have to mention before we move any further away is that when he was 16, he moved to the Mornington Peninsula. He moved to the town of Rosebud, which is a lovely name. Yeah. But it's where I was born as well. Oh, so interesting. So you got a little connection there. That's it. There's like a little little Arthur Boy connection for me there. It's just strengthening how how strong his legacy is, at least with me, which is kind of nice. That is fantastic. And I think one other thing that before we wrap this up, I just want to take a moment and and take heart because what I just heard you say is even as a grown man, you remember something from primary school. All (laughs) hope is not lost. Maybe someday somebody will remember something that I said. And absolutely. (laughs) Fundamental. Fundamentals of life. That's the dream. The the primary school teachers are the the unsung heroes of, of planet Earth, I think. They're the beginning of the journey, long forgotten, but never, you know, not as all is not lost, I think. Yeah, the, the specifics may be forgotten, but I like to think the impact will remain for years to come. That's it. And I'm wrapping it up. I want just a three point rating scale. And where should this hang? The Louvre? Is this something to look at? The lab? The lab. Is this something to learn from? Or the loot. British for the bathroom. Yeah, there's a the loot joke in there somewhere. Oh, that's terrible. To be honest, I think 
Arthur Boyd would say that it belongs in the loo. I think, uh, I know that the context of the comparisons we're making here, but I think the exposure of his art would be in a place in the loo where he would prefer. People who were just commonplace, not necessarily moving from the Mona Lisa to, uh, you know, some other gravity and weighted uh, Greek art piece, and then his work. I think the common man is where he would like to have his work, and none more so represented by Budanon, Bundanon, sorry, I'm going to butcher <laughs> it too, um, where, <laughs> you know, they're gathering everyone together to, to continue his legacy. I think, I think the common man is where he'd prefer his pictures were sitting. So I hope that doesn't break the nature of our final uh, final words there. No, I I think that's I think that's that's a really nice take and a nice perspective because he was a man of the people. He w- he was you know a self taught artist, and he wanted his artwork to be out there and accessible to everybody. And that more casual atmosphere that that makes a lot of sense. I. Mm. I I thought about it in in all different contexts. I ultimately landed on more of the lab piece just because I feel like this is one to learn from and this is one that we can dissect quite a bit and we already came up with different connections historically, mm. you know, in terms of mythology and we could get out our Joseph Campbell and talk about Hero with a Thousand Faces and all of that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. We can look at it through a number of different lenses, but it always says something, you know? And I, I think there's there's more depth to, to mine there. And to me, that's kind of what what I think of when I think of that category is just like those pieces that we can break apart and learn from and... Sadly, it's a message that's still relevant. Um, mm, definitely. Yeah. So uh, I just want to say once again, thank you very much, Matthew Bliss, host of Teaching Culture Cast, which somehow found the time to slum it with yours truly. And <laughs> <laughs> it was an incredibly good episode. If, if anyone hasn't had the chance to listen to Kyle in a different context yet, please go and have a listen. Uh, definitely not a self plug there, but we I, had a really good discussion about your approach to teaching. I, I would, I would actually advise the other episodes, but, uh, it is a fantastic <laughs> podcast. You do a great job there talking about a lot of relevant teaching issues, philosophies to, you know, education and how we approach stuff. And, um, should we plug your video game podcast too? Because I do have some younger listeners who actually do like the video games as well. Absolutely. So um, the the Dead Drop for Video Game News is a podcast I launched in the last couple of weeks. Um, it's Each episode is under 10 minutes and I run it twice a week. So it's very easy to digest. And um, it's kind of gathers together a few news stories about video game and video games and video game development specifically, just to give people a taste of what's going on in the industry. Uh, not everybody is as plugged in to it as they I'm not going to say should because realistically everybody enjoys video games and that whole subject in different ways. But sometimes it's nice to be able to pull out a topic in a conversation and say, oh, yeah, I heard about that. And and this guy told me that, um, you know, there was something really interesting going on with this particular video game. Um, so that's the kind of news articles we go for. Absolutely. And I, I, I love that you are bringing the news and the stories behind those games because i think whatever you enjoy it's good to know more about it and i think that's part of the conceit of this show is we appreciate art and artistry in all of its forms including video games it's serious work producing it yes and it's good for people to learn more about that medium and learn the stories about how things are developed and what's going on in it yeah so thank you Thank you very much once again. Really appreciate your taking the time. Thanks a lot, Kyle. It's been a pleasure to be here.
This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.